Thank you, and Christopher, thank you very much. Let me just say, by the way, that Christopher's book is essential reading too. If you want to understand how the people that run the corporations think and how they come to the conclusions they do, often despite knowing that it's going to cause damage, this is a wonderful book for that purpose. And Simon didn't mention the uh, subtitle of the book, which is great, Processes of Creative Self-Destruction. <laughs> And uh, I think the term creative self-destruction deserves to become a buzz phrase in, uh, in our industry and, and, in, and in the radical left generally. And I want to thank the Socialist Alliance for inviting me back to Australia. And I'm particularly excited to be able to introduce my book here. Uh, I do want to stress that this is the launch. This is the global launch for the book. The official publication date is actually September, um, but when I was invited to speak at this conference, I asked Monthly, Re Monthly Review Press, my publisher, if we, it would be possible to speed up production. And they said, why? <laughs> and I said, because Green Left Weekly is holding a conference. And they said, oh, Green Left Weekly, well, of course. <laughs> And you should know that the people at Monthly Review are, are really big fans of Green Left Weekly and, and of the work of the Socialist Alliance, and they really pulled out all the stops to get the book out first here. In fact, it was really quite annoying because Susan wrote me and said that the books have arrived and my copy hadn't arrived yet. <laughs> um, so I'm honored to introduce the book here. If you only read the mainstream press, you might think that a meeting of socialists would devote its time to unrealistic and, and abstract discussions of pie-in-the-sky dreams, or alternatively, depending on their mood, to evil plots to destroy civilization and impose a totalitarian dictatorship on the world. The people who write such things would, I think, be shocked to find that this session is going to be discussing the latest developments in science. In fact, a commitment to science to the natural sciences has been central to Marxism since Marx and Engels themselves devoted enormous time and effort to studying evolution, to studying soil science and geology and physics and more. And their notebooks and their writings on these subjects are really extensive. They did that because their socialism wasn't abstract. It wasn't dreamed up out of nothing. It was thoroughly and deeply rooted in the real world. For them, natural science was inseparable from politics and economics and class struggle. When he was writing his masterpiece, Capital, Marx wrote to Engels and said that what he had learned from German agricultural chemistry was, quote, more important than all the economists put together. <laughs> because understanding our world is what Marxism is about. Facing the Anthropocene, starts with the fundamental Marxist view that we need a comprehensive and concrete materialist understanding of how our world works and how our world is changing and what is causing those changes. If we don't begin from that, our political views float in midair and have no connection, no foundation no, in the real world. In Facing the Anthropocene, what I've tried to do is to bridge the gap between Earth system science and eco-socialism to show socialists why they must understand the Anthropocene and the science that it involves, and to show Earth System scientists why they must understand ecological Marxism. Now, since this is a socialist conference, I'm going to focus on science <laughs> in the first part of my talk here. Um, this is just part of what the book addresses, but it's an essential basis for developing an eco-socialist program and movement in the 21st century. I think most people, unless you actually are an earth scientist, most people are not aware that we are in the midst of a scientific revolution, one whose impact has been justly compared to Copernicus's discovery that the earth goes around the sun and not the reverse, or Darwin's theory of evolution. Scientists have long studied aspects of the way the earth works. They're using the methods of geology, bi biology, ecology, physics, and other disciplines. The past two decades, however, have seen the emergence of Earth system science, the study of the Earth not as separate pieces, but as an integrated global system, a system of systems that all function together. And the most important result of that extraordinary scientific research has been a new word, 
Anthropocene. And obviously the word isn't the most important thing, it's the concept, but that is the word. Now despite its importance, judging by my experience on this tour around Australia, I think it's safe to say that most people have never heard the word. <laughs> or if they have, they only heard it recently, and they only have a sort of vague idea of what it means. The word seemed to come out of nowhere. Although it first appeared in the scientific literature in 2000, it has remained the exclusive property of specialists in earth sciences until very recently. But five or six years ago, it came out of the closet. In addition to three academic journals and hundreds of academic papers, the Anthropocene is now the subject of innumerable newspaper and magazine articles, as well as websites, videos, and blogs. There are exhibitions about architecture in the Anthropocene and conferences about the humanities in the Anthropocene. A few weeks ago, I even saw an uh, entirely serious post on a blog, and the quote post was titled, Reading the Book of Mormon in the Anthropocene. <laughs> and books, an incredible number of books. While I was writing this talk, I just very quickly pulled down a bunch of titles and random examples. Uh, I could have shown you two or three dozen more. I'm afraid my book is going to be in for a fierce fight for display space in your local bookstores. But of course, we are serious political people. So we do not judge the importance of a concept by the number of books and the number of articles. We judge it by whether it is mentioned in daily comic strips. <laughs> and by that significant measure, the Anthropocene breakthrough occurred in December 2014 in the popular American comic strip Dilbert, <laughs> when Bob the Dinosaur asked his smart watch to tell him the time, the watch replied, this is the Anthropocene epoch. <laughs> For completeness, here's the final panel. Uh, <laughs> It's rare for a scientific term to go from obscurity and specialist use into broad use in the, in the culture. And that's what has happened with the word Anthropocene. But, and I really want to stress this, the widespread use of the term has been accompanied by an enormous wave of misinformation and confusion about what the concept means. If you have read any of the articles and books that have been published on the subject, chances are that what you read got it wrong in some substantial way. One common misrepresentation of the Anthropocene treats it just as a trendy buzzword for modern times. And you'll see uh, it's used as this like Roaring Twenties or the Jazz Age or something like that. Um, and there, that's where you get conferences with names like Art in the Anthropocene or Poetry in the Anthropocene, both, are real, both real conferences. Um, and I'm quite sure those conferences had valuable things to say about art and poetry. But it's almost certain that they had not much to say about recent scientific research and its radical implications for the future of, the, of life on Earth. Another common misconception about the Anthropocene not just in popular magazines, but even in political commentaries and some academic journals, is that it refers to the time since human beings first started changing ecosystems, first started having an effect on the environment. If that were true, if that's what it was, then the Anthropocene would be nothing new. Because the fact is that humans have always changed the world. Ever since our ancestors invented stone tools two and a half million years ago, we have been changing the world we live in. So the Anthropocene, if, it, if that's what it means, it's a, it's a minor, it's a new name for something that we've known about for a very long time. And a third common misconception is that the Anthropocene means somehow that, that humans are now in control of the natural world, that non-human nature no longer exists. Now human activity is changing the world, and I'm going to talk about that, but humans are definitely not in control. Quite the contrary, what we see is not the management and control of nature, but chaos and unintended consequences. More storms, more floods, more droughts, more deadly heat waves, more extinct species, more poisons in our air and our w in water. That's what characterizes the Anthropocene, not human control and human domination of nature. One of the most important lessons we can learn 
from the planetary crisis was actually taught long ago by Frederick Engels, who said, let us not flatter ourselves over much on account of our human conquest over nature, for each such conquest takes its revenge on us. No, the Anthropocene is not a buzzword, a trendy buzzword. It's not the time of human influence. It's not the time of human control. It is the time when human activity is disrupting the Earth system in fundamental ways, setting it on an unpredictable and dangerous trajectory. A good starting point for defining the Anthropocene would be this paragraph from three leading authorities on the subject. The term Anthropocene, they write, suggests that the Earth has now left its natural geological epoch, the present interglacial state called the Holocene. Human activities have become so pervasive and profound that they rival the great forces of nature and are pushing the Earth into planetary terra incognita, unknown territory. The Earth is moving rapidly, they write, into a less biologically diverse, less forested, much warmer, probably wetter, and stormier state. Now that's a starting point for our discussion, but it's an understatement. <coughs> we could go on, and they in fact do in their book, but this isn't their words. If the processes that are now driving global change continue, by the end of this century, if not sooner, substantial parts of the earth will be too hot to live in. Coastal areas on every continent and many island states will be flooded by rising oceans, and an ever-increasing number of animal and plant species will die out, leading in the long term to a mass extinction comparable to the death of the dinosaurs. In short, the Anthropocene isn't just a word, it's a global emergency. To understand how the Anthropocene came about, and you notice I go back and forth between Anthropocene and Anthropocene, I be, that's because I'm Canadian, halfway between English, England and the United States, <laughs> and they actually get pronounced differently. I try to say Anthropocene because that's a, for no good reason, but that's the one I, I like, but I don't always. Anyway, to understand how it came about, we need to adopt what the, uh, one of my heroes, the great American Marxist George Novak, called the long view of history. We have to begin with a view that extends beyond the usual horizons of history. If you restrict your vision to just a few decades or just a few centuries, you will not appreciate the revolutionary significance of this change. Geologists divide Earth's four and a half billion year history into a hierarchy of time intervals. They call it the geological time scale. We live in the Holocene epoch, of the Quaternary Period of the Cenozoic Era. What is now being, the Holocene, the one we're in, started about 11,700 years ago. What is now being said is that the Holocene has ended and a new epoch has begun. Now, this is a very big claim to make because the divisions on that time scale are not arbitrary or loosely defined. Each one represents major changes in the dominant conditions and forms of life on the Earth. The Cenozoic era is marked by the rise of mammals following the death of the dinosaurs. The Pleistocene epoch was marked by the repeated expansions and contractions of continental ice sheets that are usually called the Ice Ages. The Pleistocene wasn't just colder than it is today, but it was far more chaotic. This slide shows average global temperatures in the world over the past 100,000 years. This is part of the revolution in Earth science studies that's been carried over the last 20 years is the fact that we now know this. As you can see, for most of that period, it wasn't just cold, that dotted line is roughly what it is today, but it was anything but stable or uh, consistent. 11,000 years ago, 11,700 years ago, the ice retreated for the last time, and a new epoch started. The Holocene, which is characterized and has been consistently characterized by a much warmer and stable climate. During the Holocene, the average global temperature has not varied up or down by more than one degree Celsius. 
Obviously, there have been extremes within that, but the average has been consistently just a one degree variation for almost 12,000 years. Modern humans evolved about 160,000 years ago. So that's way off in that chaotic period before. But for 95% of our time on this Earth, our ancestors lived exclusively in small groups of nomadic hunter-gatherers. There's evidence that some of them experimented with cultivating plants, but the experiments were short-lived. Not because our, our ancestors weren't intelligent enough to, to deal with plants, but because the climate kept changing in extreme and unpredictable ways, making permanent agriculture impossible. Only the warmer and climatically stable conditions that began about 12,000 years ago permitted agriculture, permanent settlements, and complex civilizations to de develop and thrive. After 160,000 roughly years of being hunter-gatherers, in a few thousand years of the first few thousand years of the Holocene, agriculture was invented independently in 11 different parts of the world, widely separated parts. That led to settled communities and then to the great civilizations of the past 6,000 years. Holocene conditions, it's often said, are the only global environment that we are sure is a safe operating space for the complex and extensive civilizations that Homo sapiens has constructed. In the late 1980s, scientific concerns about global change led to the launch of the largest and most complex international scientific cooperation program ever undertaken. And when did you read about that in the Murdoch Papers? <laughs> the International Geophysical Biophysical Program, launched in 1990, involved literally tens of thousands of scientists worldwide investigating how the Earth got to the state it's in and how it's changing. The IGBP's work produced a huge step forward in our understanding of the Earth system. In 2004, they published this synthesis report called Global Change in the Earth System. It is still the best account of science in the Anthropocene. Its book is out of print, however, it's available as a, pre, a free PDF on the IGBP website if you're interested in taking a look. The report summarized the results of years of intense research into the Earth systems in these words. The planet is now dominated by human activities. Human changes to the Earth system are multiple, complex, interacting, often exponential in rate and globally significant in magnitude. They affect every Earth system component, land, coastal zone, atmosphere, and oceans. The human driving forces for these changes, both proximate and ultimate, are equally complex, interactive, and frequently teleconnected across the globe. The magnitude, spatial scale, and pace of human-induced changes are unprecedented. Today, they wrote, humankind has begun to match and even exceed some of the great forces of nature in changing the biosphere and impacting other facets of Earth system functioning. They went on, in terms of fundamental element cycles and some climatic parameters, human-driven changes are pushing the Earth system well out of its normal operating range. In addition, the structures of the terrestrial and marine biospheres have been significantly altered directly by human activities. There is no evidence that the Earth system has previously experienced these types, scales, and rates of change. The Earth system is now in a no analog situation, best referred to as the Anthropocene. The best known of these changes, the one we hear about most, the best known and most dangerous human disruption of the Earth system, affects the global carbon cycle. Scientists have known since the 1800s that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere controls the planet's temperature. But it wasn't until the work that the IGBP did in the 1990s that research showed how tightly controlled this process has been in the Earth system how tightly the greenhouse effect is linked to the global carbon cycle, and how finely tuned it is. Gases that are trapped in ancient snow 
extracted deep in Antarctica prove that for hundreds of thousands of years, the carbon cycle has kept the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, the greenhouse, great greenhouse gas, within remarkably well-defined limits. During the Ice Age, when you saw the graph of how wildly things changed, how wildly the climate changed in the Ice Ages in the Pleistocene, carbon dioxide levels were never lower than 180 parts per million and never higher than 300 in the warmer times. During the Holocene, our very stable period, the range has been between 260 and 280 for 12,000 years. This graph shows atmospheric carbon dioxide over the past 450,000 years. The level recently passed 400 parts per million. That's 33% higher than the maximum level during the wildest climate changes in the Pleistocene and 42% higher than at any time in the Holocene. Wallace Broker, who's, who's known as the uh, father of climatology, actually he's known as the grandfather of climatology, but he likes to say, the Earth's climate system is an ornery beast that overreacts to small nudges. What this graph shows is that we're not just nudging it, we're poking it with sharp sticks. And nobody should be surprised if the Earth system <laughs> strikes back violently again and again. Nor should anybody be surprised if the result is a world unlike anything humanity has ever had to live in. This year, the average global temperature passed one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level. And it has come close to 1.5 degrees, which many scientists would argue is the boundary between dangerous change and extremely dangerous change. The Earth has not been this warm since before the Ice Ages. And the temperature is continuing to rise faster than any forecast or climate model has predicted. The result, as we know, is not just warmer weather, but more extreme and changeable weather, raising the possibility of a return to the kind of climate chaotic conditions of the Pleistocene of the Ice Ages, but hot instead of cold. That shift, and many more like it, led the Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Crutzen to declare in the year 2000, in February 2000, that the Holocene is over, that the Earth system today is as different from the Holocene as the Holocene was from the Ice Ages. He proposed to call the new epoch the Anthropocene, from the Greek word anthropos and the term that's used widely for epochs, recent, so that it's the epoch of recent human impact. Contrary to what some people have charged, Crutzen did not use that word to blame humans in general. In fact, from his very first writings on this subject, he was very explicit in saying that the changes are caused by a minority of the world's population. It's the Anthropocene not because we all bear equal responsibility for it, but because it would not have occurred if humans didn't exist. Crutzen initially suggested that the new epoch may have begun at the time of the Industrial Revolution, when large-scale burning of coal launched a long-term rise in atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. That was a very important insight. But when the IGPBP set out to quantify these changes, the various changes to the Earth system since the Industrial Revolution, they discovered a surprising pattern. These graphs show 12 Earth system trends from 1750 to 2010. Carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide levels in the atmosphere, ocean acidification, depletion of fish stocks, species extinctions, forest loss, and more. Every one of those trend lines shows gradual growth beginning around the time of the Industrial Revolution and a sharp, really noticeable upturn about 1950. The period since 1950, as a result, has become known to scientists as the Great Acceleration. As the authors of the IGBP's 2004 synthesis book wrote, the last 50 years have without doubt 
seen the most rapid transformation of the human relationship with the natural world in the history of our species. Last year, in the most recent updating to those graphs, the scientists who did the work concluded that by 2010, nine of those 12 indicators had, quote, clearly moved beyond the bounds of Holocene variability. Had clearly moved out of the framework they had operated in for the whole time there has been human civilizations. Words like unprecedented, terra incognita, no analog state, are used frequently to describe the uh, current state of the earth in the scientific literature. No previous period shows comparable changes. We are now facing, by any reasonable measure, a planetary emergency. The United Nations Development Program warns that by the end of this century, the specter of catastrophic ecological impacts could have moved from the bounds of possible to the probable. Noted climate scientist James Hansen describes our situation in dramatic terms. Planet Earth, creation, the world in which civilization developed, the world with climate patterns we know and stable shorelines is in imminent peril. Socialists cannot ignore a crisis of this magnitude. Marx famously wrote that humanity makes its own history but not under conditions of its own choosing. The Anthropocene is a powerful illustration of that truth, one that Marx really could not have expected. We now face the challenge as socialists of trying to change the world in the context of impending environmental disaster on a global scale. That's the reality of our time. The way we build socialism the kind of socialism we will be able to build will be fundamentally shaped by the shape of the planet we must build it on. And the longer it takes us to get the necessary changes underway, the more difficult the transformation will be. As the Brazilian eco-socialist and atmospheric scientist Alexander Costa writes, the fight to avoid a catastrophic outcome to this crisis engendered by capitalism is the fight to safeguard the material conditions for survival with dignity of humankind. Socialism is not possible on a scorched earth, he wrote. Those hockey stick curves, the great acceleration curves, now heading almost straight up in every case, display critical impacts of aggressive capitalism spreading across the world to satisfy its appetite for capital accumulation and burning ever greater quantities of fossil fuels to achieve that end. Every day, capitalism's relentless drive accelerates. The trend lines continue to rise, and the crisis becomes more severe. The Great Acceleration is a good label for that process of the past 60 years. But a better one, in my opinion, although it is not generally used, was suggested by Gus Speth in his book, The Bridge of the Edge of the World. He said that the graphs display a great collision, a time when the global economy is crashing against the Earth. That great collision was in fact predicted 170 years ago by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels at a time when they were both still in their 20s. They wrote it this way, in the development of the productive forces, they said, there comes a stage when the productive forces and the means of intercourse are brought into being which under existing relationships only cause mischief and are no longer productive but destructive forces. That is exactly what we see in the 21st century, where capitalism, once a great source of creativity, once a great source of that improvements for humanity, is steadily making things worse. Capitalism has driven the Earth system to a crisis point between humanity and the rest of nature. If business as usual continues, the first full century of the Anthropocene will be marked by rapid deterioration of our physical, social, and economic environment. The decay of the biosphere will be most noticed by global warming and extreme weather 
but we can also expect rising ocean levels leading to widespread flooding of islands and coastal cities, the collapse of major fisheries, poisoned rivers, and more. Every global cycle is threatened, and a catastrophic convergence of multiple system failures is possible. If that were to happen, if we were to let it happen, the Anthropocene could be the shortest of all the epochs, a transition from the Holocene to something far worse. And the only way to avoid that is with methods that are anathema to capitalism, methods that capitalism cannot accept. Profit has to be removed from the consideration in the development of human societies. Changes need to be made as part of a democratically created and legally binding global plan that governs both the conversion to renewable energy and the rapid elimination of uh, industries that, such as arms production, advertising, factory farming, industries that, rather than producing wealth, produced, produce what the 19th century artist and social critic Jonathan, John Ruskin, what he called ilf, the opposite of wealth. The physical changes are serious, but they will not, by themselves, determine what life will be like in the Anthropocene. Only human action, or inaction, can do that. The world our children and our grandchildren will inherit will be defined by the way our generation responds to the planetary emergency. We need to slow capitalism's ecocidal drive. And this you'll recognize as a quote from my book, because Christopher quoted it. We need to slow capitalism's ecocidal drive as much as possible and reverse it where we can to win every possible victory over the forces of destruction. Our rulers will not change willingly but mass opposition can force them to act even against their will. Our goal must be to bring together everyone, socialists, liberals, deep greens, trade unionists, feminists, indigenous activists, and more, everyone who is willing to fight for decisive action to bring down greenhouse gas emissions. Clearly, we also need to unite conscious eco-socialists and to build a movement under, against capitalism within that context but the two tasks are not in conflict. Fighting for immediate gains against capitalist destruction and fighting for the ecological future are not separate activities. They are aspects of one integrated process. It's through united struggles for immediate gains and environmental reforms that working people and farmers and indigenous people can build the organizations and the collective knowledge they need to defend themselves and to advance their interests. The victories we win, they win, in partial struggles will help to build the confidence that's needed to take on bigger targets. Now, there are no guarantees. An eco-socialist revolution is not inevitable. It will only happen if people consciously decide to, that it's necessary and to take the steps necessary to bring it about. Way back in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels posed the alternative. They said, class struggles, in the end, lead either to a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large, or to the common ruin of the contending classes. And they said that a long time ago. In the Anthropocene, the common ruin of all, the destruction of civilization, is actually a possibility. In a passage that should be much more widely known, Karl Marx wrote that we have a duty to future generations. He said, even an entire society, a nation, or all simultaneously societies put together, taken together, are not the owners of the earth. They are simply its possessors, its beneficiaries, and they have to bequeath it in an improved state to succeeding generations. It's the kind of thing that a lot of people wouldn't realize Marx had said something like that. But it's a really important statement. 
I had that passage in mind when I got up my nerve to write to the brilliant American poet Drew Dellinger for permission to include a verse from one of his award-winning poems in my book. And believe me, I was thrilled with how quickly and positively he responded. This is the verse. The poem is called Hieroglyphic Stairway and is in Drew's book, Love Letter to the Milky Way. The verse says, it's 3.23 in the morning and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do while the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the seasons started failing. As the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying? Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? That poem struck a strong personal chord with me. I can hear my own grandchildren, that's Abby and Sam, asking exactly those questions if they have to live in a world a catastrophically damaged world, hurtling down a one-way highway to the worst possible Anthropocene. I posted Drew Dellinger's poem beside my computer while I was writing the book, so I would always be aware of what the real stakes were. The leading climate scientist, James Hansen, recently said, we are in a position of potentially causing irreparable harm to our children, grandchildren, and future generations. Now, Hansen's correct, but I prefer to change one word in his comment because it is also true that we are in a position of potentially preventing irreparable harm to our children, grandchildren, and future generations. The Holocene is over and the Anthropocene has begun. That cannot be reversed, but what we do in the next few decades will determine what the Anthropocene will be like and what kind of planet our grandchildren will live in. Next to Dellinger's poem, I posted the famous aphorism from Antonio Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Because in my view, it defines an eco-socialist attitude towards the struggle and life in the Anthropocene. We know disaster is possible, but we refuse to surrender to despair. If we fight, we might lose. If we don't fight, we will lose. And our grandchildren will pay the price. Good luck or bad luck may play a role, but a conscious and collective struggle to stop capitalism's hellbound train is our only hope for a better world. Chris quoted, po commented the other po quote that I have from Gramsci in the book, and I want to finish with it as well. Gramsci said, it is necessary with bold spirit and in good conscience to save civilization. We must halt the dissolution which corrodes and corrupts the roots of human society. The bare and barren tree can be made green again. Are we not ready? I say, and I hope you agree, that our answer to Gramsci's question must be yes, the world can be made green again, and we are ready to meet that challenge. Thank you.